Hello, everybody. Welcome uh, to your first installment of your emergency learning in the month of May. Uh, it's good to see you guys, uh, if only virtually, to have this, uh, this uh, opportunity to present uh, at least some United States history to you guys in the month of uh, May. Um, just uh, a little bit of housekeeping uh, as we start. Uh, if you're watching this video, you've already found Mr. Demchuk's emergency learning folder in Schoology. Uh, we are in week one. Uh, just a couple things up front. Uh, in that same folder, uh, you will find uh, the video files uh, for uh, four or five videos that I would normally show in the middle of this presentation, uh, but I've uh, discovered that uh, Loom may not be able to handle showing the videos and giving the presentation at the same time. So um, at least for this particular video, I'm going to do it without uh, the embedded videos. Uh, I'll probably try again later and do it with um, with the videos embedded and see if Loom can handle that this time. Uh, but this one, uh, we're just going to have a straight presentation uh, of the material. Um, you are also going to find in uh, the same folder where you found this presentation, uh, the file, uh, the video file for um, uh, America, the story of us, World War II. Uh, again, this is if you want to expand your knowledge of all of World War II, its beginnings, uh, what our role was in World War II, what the fighting was like, what some key events were, and of course how uh, World War II uh, ended, and uh, its impact on America as a uh, as a world power. Um, so uh, we've been asked to just present on one very uh, narrow aspect of World War II, and that's life on the home front. Um, I suspect uh, that uh, my boss has uh, wanted us to do this because <clears throat> in a lot of ways, this is very similar to what we're going through with uh, coronavirus right now, uh, where uh, the nation faces a threat and the nation has to, to the best of its ability, uh, act together to deal with that threat. Uh, now, of course, with the coronavirus, it's a pandemic and uh, the threat is one to all of our lives. Um, of course, in World War II, uh, the threat was kind of abstract. You know, it was fascism. It was Hitler. It was militarism in Japan. It was the uh, the risk that if we let Germany and Japan uh, dominate two thirds of the world, that that would weaken America and that ultimately perhaps uh, they would. Uh, dominate um, America. Um, so uh, without going into many of the details uh, about how that war started, uh, you do need to know that even before the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, uh, our president at the time, Roosevelt, uh, understood that the country needed to, and the word we use in history is mobilize and uh, to mobilize American industry and its people uh, to uh, make sure that we were as prepared as we could be for fighting a war. Uh, and as you're going to see in today's lecture, there's a lot that goes into fighting a war, and it's not just uh, soldiers uh, with guns and airplanes with bombs. OK, um, so um, here's how this is going to work. Uh, this video that you're watching right now is going to be a play posit video. Uh, nearly all of my students have experience with that with me. So uh, as you're watching the video, occasionally it will pause and it will ask you questions. Uh, you will not be able to fast forward, at least as I say this. I don't plan on allowing you to fast forward. Uh, but you will be able to rewind to go back and find the answers. All right. Um, this is the only. Well, I shouldn't say the only because you're going to have a choice. But uh, the one thing that I am asking you to do without fail, if you're watching this video, is to answer these play posit questions. Uh, after you're done, you'll have a choice of uh, five other assignments uh, that you might do. And you only have to do one of those uh, extra assignments. OK, um, you will see that choice board in the same Demchuk emergency learning folder that you found this uh, video in as well. OK, so. Um, so let's get talking about how America uh, prepared to 
uh, fight in World War II. And uh, at certain points in the presentation, I will make some comparisons to what we're going through right now. All right. So the first thing we have to do is convert the economy. OK, uh, um, before you're fighting a war, the economy is and that is all the things that are manufactured, produced and sold and all the things that go into that before the war. You know, that's all about the consumer. You know, that's all about the fact that your family uh, wants a car or your family wants a refrigerator or your local grocery store uh, is producing food for you and your family to eat at home. Well, obviously, uh, in wartime, uh, you don't need cars. You need tanks. Uh, you don't need uh you don't need necessarily refrigerators. Uh, you need airplanes. Um, uh, those soldiers who would normally be eating at home, well, now they're eating 4,000 miles away and they need uh, as much food as they can uh, to uh, be successful as a soldier. So we have to convert the economy. And how did we do that? Well, um, one of the reasons the United States ended up winning the war is that we ended up being twice as productive as Germany and five times that of Japan. I mean, that, uh, you know, they say a uh, they say an army fights on its stomach, which means, you know, they fight uh, when they are uh, well nourished and, and well prepared. So a lot of the success of the U.S. in World War II was the fact that we did a really good job mobilizing the economy uh, to fight this war. Uh, Roosevelt and his advisors, uh, because we are a capitalist uh, economy and our companies are set up to make profits uh, for their uh, owners and shareholders, uh, Roosevelt decided that uh, the best way uh, to mobilize was to give a profit incentive to the companies. That is, look, you're going to make it. Uh, we will pay you for whatever it costs to make the tank or the airplane but we're going to guarantee you a percentage of the cost as profit. We don't want that to be a mystery to you. You are going to make money by helping out the country. OK, um, so um, how did we get the job done? Well, uh, the industry that perhaps uh, most helped us, meaning they ended up producing one third of all the military equipment that we needed in that war was the automobile industry. And uh, you guys know from our previous unit that one of the leaders in the auto industry was Henry Ford with his uh, novel assembly line and his multiple uh, factories, which were already set up to produce large machinery. Uh, why are automobile factories great for uh, turning over to producing things for war? Well, think about it. You know, they're they're used to creating engines. They're used to creating large uh, uh, metal uh, forms of transportation. They're used to all the electrical wiring, the rubber, uh, the glass, and everything else that goes into producing. Uh, uh, transportation is the same thing that you need for weapons of war. Uh, and in this case, especially with uh, Henry Ford, it was creating airplanes. Uh, one of our more popular bombers in World War II was the B-24. You see them off to the right there. Uh, you can see, uh, I think that's uh, Ford's Red, Ru Red River Rouge or Red Rouge plant uh, in uh, in Michigan producing B-24s up there in the top right. Um, uh, and, uh, they were very successful. Uh, the B-24 was one of, uh, four or five principal bombers that we used, uh, in World War II. Now, at this point, I would, uh, normally show you a, uh, newsreel, uh, that shows the B-24, one of ours being shot down over, uh, Japan. Um, I'm going to let you, uh, watch that in the emergency learning folder because as I said, uh, I was having some problems with uh, Loom handling embedded videos. Okay, um, so moving on. Um, in addition to airplanes, of course, we need a lot of ships and these aren't necessarily all gonna be uh, warships. Uh, many of these ships will need to be cargo ships because we have to move men and material thousands of miles uh, across the water. Now, it's not so important that these ships last for 40 or 50 years, uh, their main job is to uh, win a war. So you've got to make them cheap and you've got to make them, you know, strong enough to do the job. Uh, but you have to make them efficiently and make as many as you can. Um, so um, 
Now, these ships were uh, welded instead of riveted. Uh, it made them cheaper and easier to build. Uh, it also made them harder to fall apart. Uh, it didn't necessarily make them better ships, but uh, if they were ever uh, hit by a torpedo, it would have been harder to sink these ships. Uh, here we see some pictures of those Liberty ships. Uh, we built uh, thousands of them uh, to transport uh, equipment over uh, the seas. Uh, just as a uh, uh, side note, uh, when the war was over, actually a number of these ships were uh, anchored in the James River for many, many years uh, to use for parts and to uh, be held in reserve in case uh, we needed them in an emergency. Uh, only in the last 20 years that we finally uh, scrapped all those ships that were out there in the James River. Uh, Roosevelt also created a war production board. Uh, you know, it's not unlike uh, the president's uh, coronavirus task force. And it's not unlike uh, all of the committees uh, that our governor and other governors are uh, convening to uh, figure out, you know, how are we going to help the unemployed? Uh, what businesses should be open? Um, um, you know, one thing they haven't done is addressed, uh, you know, uh, shortages of uh, certain things. Uh, well, I should say they didn't do a great job of that early on. They're starting to they're starting to rally and uh, make sure that our medical profession professionals have the things that they need. All right. Um, we're going to have to build an army now building an army. How do, what do you mean by building an army? Well, that means you've got to get men to fight, you know, and uh, yeah, after the defeat of France by uh, the Germans. So this is 1940. We're not even in the war yet. That's not going to be until the end of 1941. Uh, Congress uh, realizes that should America ever get into the war, we don't have enough men to fight. OK, uh, so uh, they are no longer against the idea of a peacetime draft. Keyword there is draft. All that means simply is that the government of the United States of America has the authority uh, to and they do it in different ways. Sometimes it's with the lottery. Sometimes it's other ways. Uh, they have the authority to make 18 year old men and older uh, go off and fight and and of course, uh, many of them will die uh, defending the United States of America. Um, we no longer have a draft, just to put your minds at ease. Uh, but we do have a, a selective service system. And uh, what that is, is uh, it is a um, governmental organization uh, whose job is to know how many 18-year-old uh, men there are available to fight at any given time. So my 18-year-olds out there, um, or many of my students today, are going to be 18 next year. Uh, just know that you will have to uh, register uh, with the Selective Service. It doesn't mean you're drafted. It doesn't mean we're going to war. Uh, you'll see that um, You'll see that uh, link uh, in the top right. It's not technically a link, but it just shows you uh, how you go and do that. Anyway, this uh, the Selective Service and Training Act was a plan for the first peacetime draft in American history. And as I said, the Selective Service system still exists today. That's the SSS up there. OK. Um, some of you, and it could be boys or girls, we know that these days, uh, played with G.I. Joes when you were growing up. Uh, I think they're still a thing. I know they've been replaced by a lot of superheroes and other kinds of toys. But um, the G.I. in G.I. Joe stands for government issue. Um, and that was the, the two words that was placed on all uniforms that uh, soldiers got when they went to their first training. Uh, and... Um, where, uh, you know, they were basically went from being a farmer, a car mechanic, to having to be a man who was trained to uh, find, fix, and kill other men. So they had to go through basic training for uh, eight weeks. Um, if you look off to the right, here's a G.I. Joe. I don't think I had that particular model. It looks like it's weird. It looks like he's a radio man and uh, some kind of sniper, which is a little odd. But, okay. Okay. Um, so there were a number of different groups uh, who participated uh, and uh, contributed to the success of the United States in World War II. Uh, of course, there were the soldiers I just talked about, but 
Uh, there were other groups who, without their help, uh, it would have been harder for us to win that war in the time that we won that war. Um, the first uh, group I want to talk about are women. Congress established a Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, or WAC, in May 1942. This is the first time ever that women had been actually allowed in the military. Of course, uh, Claire Barton and people like that were nurses back in the Civil War, but they weren't actually uh, official members of the United States Army. By 1943, women had become a integral part of uh, regular war operations. Uh, eventually, the Army, the Coast Guard, the Navy, the Marines all set up their own women's organizations. Uh, you see uh, the women uh, Army Air Corps uh, pilots. Uh, you see them, uh, the women Air Force service pilots, I should say, and they were called WASPs. Get it? Like the uh, stinging... Uh, uh, member of the B family. Um, they were women who actually flew those, let's say, B-24s from Ford's uh, Michigan uh, aircraft factories to the actual bases where ultimately uh, uh, American male pilots would then fly them into, into war. All right. Okay. And uh, I'm going to be getting to kind of the propaganda that they used in the war. Uh, not all propaganda is meant to get you to hate your enemy. Some of it's get you to sign up for your own military. And in this case, of course, uh, we see a very noble looking woman. Uh, and it says, this is my war, too. So it's encouraging uh, those women to play a part in the war. Uh, African-Americans uh, played a very key role in World War II. Uh, ultimately, of course, that was to help fight and win that war. But uh, for many of them, it was also uh, a an effort to combat racism and to not that anybody should have to prove themselves worthy of rights. Uh, African Americans felt that if they participated in World War II, that would help to combat the racism uh, that many of them were still facing. And as you're going to see, it wasn't only in uh, the Jim Crow South uh, that that racism existed. Okay, so um, at the beginning of the war, American military, as you may know, was still segregated. And doesn't matter if you were living in the North or the South. Uh, African-Americans were organizing their own military units with white officers in command. Those very same African-Americans, uh, if they were home on leave in the South, they were disenfranchised, meaning they were often denied the right to vote in the Jim Crow South. Uh, one African-American newspaper took the lead in promoting this idea that Afri African-Americans uh, you know, should fight not only to help America win the war, but it could be a victory over racism as well at home by showing others that they were worthy of being uh, soldiers. Um, so uh, Roosevelt, he was a Democrat. And at that time, uh, many African-Americans uh, were supporting uh, Roosevelt. He knew that the African-American vote had helped him win. So he ordered the U.S. military to recruit and send African-Americans into combat. All right. Uh, I want to talk about one particular unit uh, in uh, the U.S. military, and that was the 99th Pursuit Squadron. It was an African-American unit. Uh, these African-American pilots became known as the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, many of you have probably heard of them or seen them in passing on the news. Uh, uh, the ones that are still surviving, and I think there's one or two, you know, are well into their 90s. Um, uh, Tuskegee, you've heard that name before. I uh, remember uh, Booker T. Washington uh, helped found the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. And many of uh, these African-American pilots were uh, members or graduates, rather, of the Tuskegee uh, Institute. Uh, what was their job? Well, they flew fighter planes. And uh, one job of the fighters was to escort uh, our bombers deep into Germany. Um, and they uh, fought, flew and fought with distinction in World War II. Um, so, um, this is true of a lot of things, um, because the military gave African Americans the opportunity to fight, albeit in segregated units, uh, it showed that they could be, uh, as, uh, effective as soldiers, as, uh, any, uh, white soldier or airman. And so, uh, it wasn't long after World War II, just three years after World War II, that the United States military desegregate. And as you all probably know, it's not going to be until um, nine years after with the Brown Board, uh, Brown versus uh, 
Board of Education decision that uh, the process will start to integrate uh, our public institutions. Um, unfortunately, well, we'll cover this a little bit um, in uh, later weeks uh, in May, but uh, it won't be until uh, the 1960s uh, that places like Bayside High School are fully integrated. All right. Um, at this point, I would normally show you a trailer for Red Tails. It's a great movie about these uh, African-American fighter pilots. You're going to see that link. It'll say Red Tails, Tuskegee Airmen, and it will be in Demchuk's emergency learning folder. All right. Uh, Hispanics and Asian-Americans. Uh, Hispanics fought in many units, but they were not segregated as were uh, African-Americans. Asian-American regiments were formed, uh, such as the Nisai uh, Regiment, uh, which earned a high number of military uh, decorations uh, for their valor and service. Uh, they were uh, segregated. Now, just a, a little note about Nisai. Uh, Nisai means that your parents were born in Japan, but you were born in America. Uh, your parents would have called the Isai. Uh, these uh, American citizens, having been born in America, were called the Nisai. Uh, now, we're going to get back to the experience of the Isai and the Nisai uh, in uh, here in America during World War II. It's one of uh, the sadder uh, chapters in World War II and in American history, how we treated the Japanese Americans. Okay. Um, all right. Native Americans. Uh, Native Americans served in integrated units, but one group uh, received special honors, and uh, you've probably heard of them as well. They're the Navajo Code Talkers. Uh, because their language was oral and never written down, unless you were a Navajo and unless you'd been raised with it, uh, there was no way you could break a code uh, because, you know, most of us, you know, learn a language by, you know, using a textbook, having a teacher uh, comparing the uh, written word in Japanese to or I'm sorry, the written word. Yeah, well, Japanese to uh, the written word in English. Well, the Navajo, since they had no written language when they talked on uh, <clears throat> the radio, the only people who could understand them were other Navajo. So uh, they were used extensively in the Pacific when we were talking about moving ships to certain battles, uh, played a big role uh, in battles like Iwo Jima, which was a horrible battle. It lasted for a month. Uh, over 23,000 men were killed, uh, 7,000 Americans. Uh, and 16, 17,000 Japanese Americans on a, uh, excuse me, Japanese, excuse me, uh, on a three square mile island. Um, now, uh, ultimately, the Navajo Code Talkers uh, did receive uh, recognition for uh, their efforts. In 2001, they were awarded the Congressional Gold Medal for their contribution to the war effort. Uh, here we see some of them. I think this is at halftime of a pro basketball game. Uh, being recognized for uh, their service. Okay, life on the home front. Compared to the devastation in Europe and Asia, World War II, ironically, it had a positive effect on American society. It put an end to the Great Depression, uh, which was uh, something that we looked at uh, during our continuous learning. Um, you know, some people, uh, some of my students have heard of uh, President Roosevelt's New Deal. Remember, he was president from 1932 all the way until 1945 when he died of a stroke. He was actually elected to four terms. <clears throat> he had created a program uh, to address the depression. The New Deal um, lessened the impact of the depression. Uh, it may have helped us get out of it sooner, but it didn't end the depression. War ended the depression. And uh, you'll often hear uh, this, at least in America, war is good for business. And in the case of World War II, it was. Uh, almost 19 million jobs were created. Uh, there was a lot of movement to those jobs. Uh, <clears throat> while there were uh, ethnic uh, units in the U.S. military, there were still lots of uh, ethnic groups within America who now had jobs available to them that normally would have been filled either by uh, the white soldiers who were off fighting or um, by others. Um, <clears throat> it's at this time that we see this mass movement of people. You know, we talked um, in uh, Unit 7 about the Great Migration, about uh, right around the time of World War One, a lot of African Americans moving out of the South to the North and some to the West. Well, that continues in World War II. Uh, we see the creation of what is called the Sun Belt. You see it here in red in this video, uh, excuse me, in this picture down below. Um, uh, people, uh, People moved out west uh, to factories. Okay, uh, some industrial factories uh, 
sprang up in the South and uh, in this area called uh, the Sun Belt. Uh, over time, the federal government allocated over $1.2 billion to build public housing, schools, community centers uh, to accommodate all those new workers. So uh, we have a lot of movement and a lot of opportunity during World War II. Uh, back to women. Um, some of you may have heard of the fictional character, uh, Rosie the Riveter. Uh, based on a character from a popular song by a popular band uh, back then called the Four Vagabonds. Uh, Vagabond is just a person who wanders from place to place. Uh, became a symbol for the campaign to hire women. Now, uh, the woman on the left, that's Rosie the Riveter. Um, now, she was portrayed a couple different ways. Uh, obviously, you can see they used a different model. And uh, this woman on the right, she has actually a rivet gun. And remember, uh, you use rivets to put together airplanes, not Liberty ships because they were welded. Uh, but um, this was sometimes it helps for people to have a symbol in their mind of a courageous person um, leading us to, into action. So it could be uh, Uncle Sam. It could be Columbia, which we saw uh, in the American Progress painting from the 1800s. Uh, here we have Rosie the Riveter. Now, just as a side note, Rosie, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the name of the woman that uh, it was based on. But this model, uh, she just died, actually, in the last uh, 10 years. Um, anyway. Uh, What's the point? Well, we're going to need women, and many of these women are married women who are used to being in the home uh, to go to work in the factory. So uh, this form of propaganda, propaganda, this poster was uh, done to do that. Um, now, uh, again, in the folder in Dem Trucks Emergency Learning, you will see this short video. It's from America, the story of us, and it tells the story of uh, Rosie the Riveter and women's contribution to the war effort. All right, African Americans gaining ground. Uh, this ties into what we were talking about before. Uh, African Americans resumed the Great Migration. Some of them left the South. They headed to cities in the North and the West. Uh, now, as we talked about before, just because they're moving into areas that traditionally did not have a lot of African Americans doesn't mean that suddenly they're going to uh, be accepted. They weren't. There was racism in the North uh, and in the West, and uh, sometimes it ended with uh, violence. Um, factories initially resisted the hiring of African Americans, uh, but uh, you will recall that African Americans uh, played a key role in the railroad industry as uh Sleeping car porters and the leader of that union really pushed Roosevelt to uh, secure jobs for African-Americans. And consequently, and again, we're not even in the war yet. June 25th, 1941, the president responds with executive order 8802. And it says that he would accept uh, uh, would declare that no discrimination in the employment of workers in uh, defense industries or uh, government uh, would be accepted. All right. And uh, here we see Mr. Randolph on a commemorative uh, stamp. All right. Back to Japanese Americans. After Pearl Harbor, strong anti-Japanese prejudice and the fear and false belief they were aiding the en enemy led to a lot of hostility and prejudice toward these Japanese Americans. Uh, it's hard for <clears throat> it's hard for me to uh, talk about what a shock uh, well to describe and get it across to you what a shock. Uh, Pearl Harbor was for people to be surprised, attacked, and to lose almost 2,500 men uh, on one uh, beautiful Sunday morning on December 7th, 1941. Well, uh, there was a lot of hatred, and <clears throat> uh, sadly, for uh, Japanese Americans, the Nisai who were born here, uh, and their parents, the Isai, uh, they bore the brunt of uh, this prejudice. On February 19th, 1942, President Roosevelt signed an executive order allowing the War Department to declare any part of the United States a military zone and remove anybody from that zone. Now, it was really designed and targeted at Japanese Americans. Uh, the West Coast was declared a military zone and all people of Japanese ancestry were evacuated to 10 internment camps. So let's pause here and think about that. You've got some Japanese Americans who have been in the country for, I remember Angel Island, you know, they've been in the country for 40 years already. They've set up businesses, sometimes thriving businesses. Uh, many of their children, their first language is English. It's not Japanese. Uh, and suddenly the country says, and if, if you are an American, you have rights. Well, suddenly we say, well, those rights don't apply to you. Uh, most of the people interned in these camps were ultimately treated well, but that does not uh, make up for the fact that they lost their freedom for four years and many of them lost their property. Um, 
at the time, the Supreme Court upheld the right of the government to intern groups in these cases. In later years, though, uh, the country came around and issued a public apology. Uh, uh, public apology for what we did to the Japanese Americans. Uh, and uh, I believe the amount was $20,000 <clears> we paid to any individual whose uh, uh, parents or grandparents were adversely affected by them being placed into these camps. Uh, just a, a few uh, photos to show you uh, what that looked like. Uh, we see Japanese Americans uh, being uh, forced to uh, leave their communities and uh, be transported to these uh, internment camps. Some of them were up in the high desert, far away from San Francisco or Los Angeles, the places that these people were used to. Uh, we see this photograph in the top right. Remember that word nativism, where you have an extreme dislike for foreign born folks? Well, uh, this woman is not making any, uh, you know, uh, it's not trying to hide the fact uh, that she's a native. It's Jacks keep moving. This is a white man's neighborhood. And of course, uh, this always shocks me. If you look at this family in the lower right, uh, they've got these uh, identification tags on, you know, and for a lot of people today, you know, that reminds them of the uh, gold stars that Jews had to wear uh, during uh, World War II. And of course, uh, we know ultimately what happened to those Jews in the Holocaust. Uh, while there was uh, <clears throat> no execution, <laughs> Uh, there was, uh, you know, I don't want you to think that the internment camps uh, were like uh, Nazi concentration camps. Uh, but uh, if you're a Japanese American, uh, you might differ. OK, uh, at this point, I would show you this really cool short little video about Japanese internment. That's also going to be in Demchuk's emergency learning floor. OK, um, youth trouble. Imagine you've got <clears throat> you've got uh, millions of men, some of them who uh, had, many of them already had children, they'd gone off to war. So now you have youths uh, who only have a woman in the home uh, enforcing uh, discipline. So crimes among youth are gonna uh, rise dramatically. Um, <clears throat> let me talk a little bit about Zeet Sheet. So I'm gonna show you, uh, <laughs> see these guys in the lower right. Uh, I think this is actually part of a, a, a Halloween costume company, but that's a zoot suit. Obviously, you can see that the pants are baggy, the jackets are big, you got a big hat. Well, uh, the zoot suits are going to play a role in one ugly chapter uh, in American domestic history, meaning our history here in America during uh, World War II. Uh, zoot suits were often worn by young Mexican Americans, and uh, you had a lot of soldiers and sailors uh, in LA. Uh, who were offended to see these young Mexican-Americans wearing so much cloth. Why? Well, as you're going to see later on, we were rationing cloth, and they believed that this was unpatriotic. You know, uh, essentially what this is, is, you know, it's just basically racism. Uh, you know, it, it's they're being, these sailors and soldiers are being given an opportunity to act out on their bigotry. Uh, and uh, uh, while... The zoot suitors were initially rumored to attack several sailors. 2,500 soldiers and sailors stormed into Mexican-American neighborhoods in Los Angeles, and that uh, racial violence uh, was an ugly uh, stain in, in uh, the story of uh, World War II. Uh, now, having said that, of course, Mexican-Americans uh, fought bravely, and some of them were awarded the highest medal for valor in World War II, uh, the Congressional uh, Medal of Honor. All right, daily life in wartime America. So we taken care of building all the bombs and the airplanes and the tanks and all that kind of stuff. Well, what else do we have to do? Well, we have to organize. Uh, we have to organize labor. All right, and excuse me, we have to organize labor. So uh, Roosevelt creates a labor board, and uh, its chief purpose was to prevent. Uh, laborers from striking because if people are out on strike, they can't be producing the uh, materials that we need for war. Um, uh, American unions during the war issued a no strike pledge. Okay, so uh, moving to rationing, and this is uh, one thing that probably makes you think of coronavirus. Probably some of you right now wishes that we had rationed uh, toilet paper so that everybody would have access to it and nobody would uh, hoard toilet paper. Well, um, the same applied during World War II. Um, the government had to limit the availability of some products so that they uh, would not run short and not be available for our soldiers. Uh, so uh, we limited the availability of products. Again, it's called rationing. Um, here we see a ration card right here. Uh, 
when when you need a lot of raw materials and supplies and those raw materials and supplies are usually used for things that we consume at home uh, but now we're fighting a war we risk those shortages so uh, this is a way to maintain the supply of essential products to the war effort each month uh, a book of ration coupons was given to each household for processed foods meats fats and oils um, all right uh, I want to show you uh, some of the propaganda around uh, rationing. Uh, on the lower left, you see food is a weapon. Don't waste it. Uh, obviously, if uh, you're cleaning your plate, you're not uh, wasting food uh, that uh, uh, might otherwise, you know, have gone to a soldier. Buy wisely, cook carefully, and eat it all. Uh, over here, you see a soldier drinking coffee. Well, does this have to do with the war? Well, you know. You need a good cup of joe if you're going to get up and go killing. Um, do uh, with less so they'll have enough. Um, many people reuse their coffee grounds. Uh, some of them switch to other types of uh, teas and bark coffee and stuff like that. Um, I like this middle poster without rationing. Rationing means a fair share for us all. Uh, these look like cans of tomato paste, but just imagine that they are toilet paper today. All right. Uh, Victory Gardens were planted to produce more food for the war effort. Scrap guys were organized to collect spare rubber, tin, aluminum, steel. Uh, Americans exchanged bacon grease, meat drippings for extra ration coupons because fats and oils were so vital to the production of, wait for it, explosives. Yeah, believe it or not, uh, you need something to bind all of the gunpowder together. The explosive and bacon grease and meat drippings are great for that. Um, so, um, here we see two more, uh, posters. Obviously this is, uh, meant to, uh, have you focused on growing your own food so that the large farms can produce food for, uh, for soldiers overseas. Um, man, a lot of metal toys, which were produced before, uh, World War II, man, these kids, they had to give up their, their metal fire truck because why we needed it. And to make bullets, okay? Uh, people uh, gave away their rubber bands, metal, rags, anything they could to help the war effort. All right, just as in World War I, uh, we had to raise money for that war. And again, the key word here is bonds. We use war bonds. We're uh, sold to help Americans pay for the war. I haven't heard anything like that uh, with the coronavirus. But as you guys all probably know, our economy is taking a huge hit. Let's hope we don't go into a depression. Uh, and let's hope uh, that we can come up with some measures to safely reopen society. Um, so, uh, and again, how bonds work. You give the government $18.50, and when the war is over, they give you $25 uh, in return. Okay, so, and you can see in this one on the right, I don't know if you can see the Nazi shadow on the uh, American front lawn, and these kids are in its shadow. So uh, it's meant to encourage you, and here, of course, Uncle Sam is uh, telling you, reminding you what's going on overseas. All right, and then finally, uh, censorship. Uh, with regard to mass communication, as you guys probably know, there's all sorts of things on social media about the coronavirus and about half of it is not true. Um, um, so uh, with regard to World War II uh, mass communication, the U.S. government had to maintain strict censorship. And of course, censorship is when the government limits uh, the amount and types of information that you can share with your wife your son, your daughter, your neighbor. Uh, it's meant to, the censorship is meant to focus us on the war. Uh, for example, you were not going to see a dead American soldier on a beach uh, in a photograph. They wanted to keep morale up. Now, of course, that's changed now. Uh, and uh, we uh, often see portrayals of American soldiers uh, who've been killed in war. Um, it's also meant to uh, keep information from the enemy. Um, this uh, private snafu uh, video you see in the lower left, again, check these out. If you guys uh, were uh, took enough initiative to be watching me right now, go back to this folder and watch these videos. Uh, this actually shows a cartoon soldier who thinks it's okay to write a letter to his wife telling him that he thinks they're going off to the Pacific. Well, obviously, we don't want uh, the Japanese, if they're listening or finding these letters, to know where these units are going. Uh, and so you had to very much limit. Uh, what you put out there in the world. Okay, folks, uh, I know that was fast, uh, but a um, little uh, tip about play posit. I should have said this at the beginning, but you'll be able to see it for later play posit. Uh, you can actually speed me up. I already talk fast, but you can actually speed the uh, the speed of my voice up so you can uh, 
uh, go through these presentations faster and answer the questions faster. Hey, I hope you guys are all well. Um, uh, if you're watching this, uh, just know that I will be available for a Google Meet for 30 minutes during each um, uh, block. So if, if you have me 1A, uh, I'll be putting that information in the emergency learning folder. Uh, I really miss you guys. Take care.